we do have artificial wombs, they should be publicly owned. Pregnancy doesn't just create a baby. A pregnancy also creates a mother. As a gay man, this is a plausible way for me to actually have a genetically related kid. The first theme of this debate is about whether or not it's actually time to, to basically make childbirth a technological, not a biological phenomenon. So we, uh, obviously our speakers have already addressed the fact, and we all know this intuitively, that currently reproduction is very much within the realms of biology. It is, some would say, selection of the fittest, et cetera, et cetera, that we are only here to, to reproduce effectively. And what we're talking about is, is the introduction of a technology that allows us to divorce that. So I'd like for us to talk a little bit about um, how we feel about technology, technology this big, potentially encroaching so much on, on, a, on an area of biology that's generally seen as quite sacrosanct, quite fundamental to our literal purpose on Earth from certain perspectives. So should we allow technologies to tinker with the biology at such a fundamental level? We, you already alluded to this. Chromosomal sex is established at fertilization. It's with us from the second that we are an individual. This is a, this is a big thing that we're talking about potentially altering. I think the consequences would be extremely difficult to predict. And although it's the, the panel has framed it as something which would liberate women, I would venture to suggest that it would in fact have a number of potentially quite negative consequences for women. Um, it's difficult to think of a more complete way of erasing women in, in the cultural sense that we've been understood for millennia than by, than by abstracting childbirth and gestation, childbirth and motherhood from women. Should we be tinkering with biology at such a fundamental level? I, my, my two honourable co-panellists are of the view that we can't stop people tinkering and that the technology is just going to happen whether we want to, whether we want it to or not. I would respectfully disagree with that. I think tech determinism is itself a moral choice. And once you've made that choice, then you've, you've thrown up your hands and you've said, we're, we're just going to have to roll with whatever comes along. But I think it's possible to be considerably more judicious, considerably more prudential about which technologies we choose to embrace and which we don't. And I think an, an important, I would say even a central metric for why, which technologies we should embrace is, is an understanding of why we're doing so and, and what, what we think people are for, fundamentally. Now, I, I suspect that Anders will disagree with me on this, but I'm, I'm deeply concerned about embracing technologies which seem to pick away at the foundations of what makes us human. And I would say that the, the relationship between a mother and a baby, which I've already, uh, I've, I've founded my, my opening pitch in the relationship between a mother and a baby, is so foundational to what we think people are for and our interdependence with one another, our relationality, our, our, our understanding of why we should reach out in empathy towards somebody who needs our help, that if we were to embrace technologies which undermine that at the absolute foundation, we would risk chipping away at our capacity for relationship full stop. And I would question whether or not that, I would question the wisdom of doing that. Get in there. Yeah, so I'd like to um, just sort of respectfully disagree a little bit from the evolutionary anthropological perspective, which is that we are incredibly flexible and adaptive and creative as a species. And we have the ability to create social relationships in the world that are independent of biological relations with each other. Now, those biological relations, and particularly, I mean, I'm a mom, I understand the importance of that intimate bond that you're referring to. But I also think it's very important to recognize that there are vast inequalities in the way that women are gestating and delivering babies. In my country, black women have a much higher maternal mortality rate than white women do. There are prenatal nutritional deficiencies that are going to be lifelong burdens on those children because of socioeconomic inequalities that limit the amount of food and nutrients that a mother can have while she's gestating this child. So to the extent that the artificial womb can be a force for good in the world, it's 
because in my mind, this is the only justification for it in some ways, it's not just so that we can have gender equality, so that we can be more available for capital to exploit us because we don't have to take maternity leave. It's because there's going to be a fundamental equality in the, you know, the gestational situation of babies. They're gonna have the nutrients that they need. They're gonna have the external factors that are optimal for creating a child in a good way. I mean, and, and I don't know enough about the technology to exactly explain, you know, what the amniotic fluid needs to contain for that to happen. But that's why I want to say that if this is the future, right, if we have a technology that's available that is going to somehow equalize the gestational experience that babies have, and if we can mitigate some of the negative uh, effects of not having this in utero bond, um, that's precisely why it has to be a kind of NHS thing, right? Everybody, it's not just a technology that rich people are gonna be able to buy to have designer babies. It has to be something that everybody has access to, particularly people who are giving birth to babies right now that are gestationally disadvantaged compared to other back, babies. Can I jump back in on the sure. first thing? Because I think this is really interesting. You're assuming, I mean, this is a big if, um, yeah, but your, the premise of your argument is, is that we would be able to develop a technology which is as good as, in every possible respect, um, gestating a, a mother gestating a baby. Um, I, would, I would humbly suggest that what we likely end up with is the gestational equivalent of formula milk, which is to say it's okay, um, but it's expensive, it's, it's okay, and what it serves as is a technology which then, um, so, which, which is a kind of, it's an all right substitute, but it's not perfect, and it's not as good as breast milk, and it's not as adaptive as breast milk, and it doesn't have the, uh, the capacity to adapt and to supply immune, immunological support and to do all of those other things that breast milk does, because it's not fundamentally alive and it's not fundamentally in relationship with the baby. And therefore, artificial wombs would not be a resource for rich women, because rich women are the ones who get to stay home. Rich women are the ones who get to, it's the, it's the wives of billionaires now who have five kids. Everybody else has to have, you know, grudge, just about manages too if they're lucky. And then they bang, they're straight off into childcare, you know, at, at a far, at far too young an age. Um, it, the artificial wombs would be a resource that would be forced reluctantly onto poor women. And, 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 I, and so I would, I, I would suggest that where you and I are possibly in alignment yeah. is in thinking about the class implications right. of this. And in, and in fact, and, and the, the, the immense uptake of formula milk, uh, predominantly among, among poorer and work, more working class women, would be replicated in artificial gestation. And who knows what the implications of that would be, because if it were a resource which was employed by poor women, you can guarantee that nobody would be working very hard to mitigate all of those relational issues. And, and, and we can only speculate as to what the long-term scaled up consequences of that would be. Yeah, so I definitely uh, believe that the technology, if it is to be developed in a world that is ruled by capitalism, is going to be a technology that is probably going to be available by a for-profit corporation at an incredible expense, and it will probably be for rich women, because the wives of billionaires are not necessarily gestating their own babies, they're gestating them in Ukraine and in India and in other countries. So, so you know, gestational connection is something that a lot of people are very happy to outsource as long as they get the baby at the end. But I am a little bit more optimistic about the technology, and I agree with you that if the technology was the equivalent of formula milk, right? And it is, ends up being something that's forced on people. You know, the other ethical disagreement that I've really taken seriously is some women, and, and particularly feminists, are very concerned about the Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church could hoover up the entire world supply of artificial wombs, and there would never be another abortion because all of these, um, fetuses would be then owned by the Catholic Church, gestated by the Church to create this sort of army of Catholics. Mm. Um, which is, it sounds like a weird science fiction plot, but, but there's a real concern there because let's face it, who has the resources to buy up the entire world's supply of artificial wombs? It's probably the Catholic Church. Um, and they have the ideological and theological reason to do so. So there are other weird implications of this. But in my world, if this technology was really good and it was like an optimal technology and it actually didn't hinder the, bird, the bond, then I think that there would be real 
disturbing class implications. Go, go on, Anders, and then I'll jump uh, in after. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting, we're, we're making a lot of assumptions about what the technology would be, and we don't know. Uh, that is going to turn out later, we're going to see how well it works. And probably it's not going to work very well at the start and be really expensive and really risky and it's going to be ethically tricky to test it out. And then gradually we are going to make it cheaper and better. Uh, typically technologies that are services tend to be fairly expensive. Um, and this is a reason to be somewhat concerned about this. On the other hand, you can also make even services uh, more uh, inexpensive. But generally, when it comes to pregnancy, we have technologized it and medicalized it already. And for the, I think in general, for the best, because we have brought down infant and maternal mortality. We actually have figured out a lot of ways of preventing many things that can go wrong during or after pregnancy. We have things like contraceptives. And again, the first contraceptives were really expensive. They were an elite male tool. But then they became inexpensive, and then, of course, against the opposition from a lot of people, they became really inexpensive, and that, I think, has had really good effects in general, and also caused very big societal effects, because it split reproduction from sex. That's a big deal. I mean, in terms of relationships between the, the genders, or within them, and how we build up society, that changes a lot. And I think many of us would say, yeah, and generally for the better. We're rather happy that uh, the maternal mortality is down, even though you could have argued that actually having a high maternal mort mortality, that's part of the human condition. Uh, after all, being a mortal, that's kind of what being human is about. So w women should be dying a lot. They have been doing that across history. And then we brought it down. We brought down infant and maternal mortality, and that's one of the great successes of humanity. So I think just because this might upset our current view of how the relationship works, I don't think that is a particularly strong reason. We need to be careful, but we need to figure it out. Similarly, we might want to figure out, can they be made cheap? Uh, I do think that the abortion thing is interesting. I wrote a paper about uh, whether cryonics could be used instead of abortion, and it's basically the same uh, problem. I think that one is probably a minor issue. But who knows? The viability argument in abortion is kind of a, one of the strong arguments people are using in the debate. And if there exists a way of making a, a, an embryo at any age viable, that would change that debate quite profoundly. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.